Our series today. By the way, my name is Eric. I'm the lead pastor here and thankful uh, to be continuing our series today called Stories of Change. Uh, last week, we actually started this series, but we had to do it online. And I give major props to Kenny, our, our student pastor, who did a phenomenal job. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, he's had a hard week. Clap for him a little bit more. Go on. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> he's had a great week, I'm sure. He, he's good. But anyway, uh, he did a phenomenal job, and our, our band, you know, leading and putting that together, our, our team doing that was awesome. We didn't want to have you guys here and a tornado be coming through as, as they always tell us it's going to be, and it's always, you know, usually not as bad as they tell us, but we just wanted to be safe. But we kicked it off last week, and I'm going to be continuing that this week. And in this series, we're looking at different Old Testament uh, leaders and characters who encountered God and had radical change. Uh, people who trusted God for the impossible, people who believed and did things for God that were in, in just, in just powerful, powerful things. And uh, today, as I was preparing this message and thinking about uh, this specific talk, uh, the word faith kept coming to my mind. Uh, the word faith, and that's really kind of where I want to dive in today is this idea of faith. Uh, because we hear that word, and oftentimes when we hear the word faith, we nod our head and we go, yeah, I like it. Sounds good, right? We, we, we hear it, we're like, yeah, I, I agree with that. But, but actually, what is faith? I mean, is faith just a mental acceptance of something? Is faith uh, something I earn by, by doing a certain amount of religious activity? Do we really understand what it means? Uh, or, or is faith believing in myself like Dr. Phil tells me to? What, what is faith? Is it self-reliance? What is faith? You know, before I became a follower of Jesus, I would hear people, you know, oh, you've got such faith. Not about me, <laughs> but about other people, like on TV and stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, what are, what are they talking about? And so often when people would reference that, they were just talking about self-reliance. Like, you've got a lot of belief in you. Well, that's awesome, but what a good does that do for us in the long run? I'm not telling you not to be uh, uh, self-confident, but there's a difference in self-confidence and faith. What is faith? Do we really understand what it means? As I kind of unpack this today, I want to kind of give you a visual, and the visual is this, this stool. You see, I believe that is a stool, I believe it. I mean, I have no doubt about it. It's got four legs. It is a stool 100%. And I guarantee you, everybody in here would say, yes, I believe that is a stool. And see, this is kind of in a lot of the ways, the way we envision and kind of live out belief or faith, as we would describe it, oftentimes in, in the South. I believe in God. I believe he exists. I believe Jesus is the son of God. Well, that's wonderful. So do the demons, according to James, the half-brother of Jesus in the New Testament. Simple mental acceptance that something exists does not mean I have faith. I believe that this is a chair, but when I, this is faith. When I put my weight and I put everything I am and everything I have in the chair, in this stool, now I have faith in the stool. Before, I just believed it was a stool, and nobody would debate me. But now, in my life, I have put my personal, uh, my personal faith and trust in this chair. I have put every bit of my weight. If this chair breaks, I'm going to be hurting. But I'm believing, and I'm putting my faith in the fact that this chair will hold me when I sit on it. I've put my faith in this chair. That's what it means is when we put our faith, it's more than just mentally believing that Jesus is the Son of God, but it's when I put my life, my everything, my weight in the person and work of Jesus Christ. 
That's why it's called good news is because when we put our weight and trust in everything that we have in him, we are eternally secure before God the Father because of what Jesus has done. But so often what we like to do is we kind of like it halfway, right? We kind of like to just put a look like a model. Anybody want to take a picture? Okay. I gave you a chance. You could have done it. You missed it. No, but we, get, we just like to put a little bit of weight, a little bit of trust in Jesus, but we still want to stand on our own feet. We still want to trust ourselves, right? But true biblical faith is to trust my everything in the person and work of Christ. That's what biblical faith is. That's what it means to have a relationship with God is to say, God, I can't do it on my own. I'm putting my, my eternal trust in who you are and what you've done, and I'm putting all that in you. But to live a life of faith is what's hard. Now, you may be here today and you may be exploring the claims of Jesus and you're not a follower of Christ. Man, I wanna tell you, keep coming, keep exploring. We wanna help you. I've been in your shoes. I know how it feels. But you may tell you what's even harder than beginning a relationship with Jesus is continuing to walk out a life of faith. <laughs> like, it's hard. Like, here's the deal. It's easy for me to go, whew, I trust you, Jesus. I'm, I, I, my eternity is secure in you. I believe Jesus died on the cross. I'm putting my faith and my trust and my eternity in you. But now it's time for me to live again. I still, I still believe Jesus died on the cross, but I don't want to live my life and, and make all my decisions based on, on what you say. I want to do my own thing. I want to kind of be halfway in. I still believe you are who you say you are, God. I still believe a little bit. I, I'll halfway be on, but I'm not fully putting my weight and trust in who you are and what you've done with my life. You see, walking by faith is everything I have, all my decisions, my family, my career, my resources, my everything. To walk by faith is to put everything on the person and work of Jesus Christ and to trust God with my life. That is hard. Anybody with me? I mean, that, that, that's like hard. I don't know about you, but I love me and I love to do what I wanna do. And for me to trust God with all my decisions and everything and to submit myself to his word and how he says I'm supposed to do everything is really, really tough. I wanna kinda do this. I want the eternal goods Right, But I also want to be in control. And this is a struggle for all of us. We all battle with going back and forth and saying, God, I want to live by faith. I want to walk by faith. I want to trust you with my life. Uh, I don't know, God. I kind of want to control it myself. Uh, I'll do it again. You know, it's this battle that we live in. It's this struggle that we all have. But you see, here's the thing. How we live our lives matters. And for me, I want to live my life by faith. I truly want to trust my life in the person and work of Christ, my decisions, my finances, my family, my, my career. I really do want to, I know it's cliche to say, I want, I want to trust God with everything, but I truly want to live that kind of life. It kind of goes back to what we talked about two weeks ago, where we talked about where our church has been and where we believe God is taking us and, and the risk that we've got to take to go to that next level. The reason that so often we as churches can become comfortable is because we, we live in fear and we're afraid to, to take those risks because we don't know what it all means. To fully live by faith and really trust you, God, and really take risks for you, God, and, and to really give it all for you, that's scary. It's a lot easier to kind of just do it halfway and say, you know, God, we'll, we'll believe you fully, but we're not really willing to, like, follow you all in. Do we really have that kind of faith? Do I really believe God can? Do I really believe God will do the impossible in my life? Do I really believe God will do the impossible in your life? And, and do you believe that and in our church? Or is following Jesus simply a get out of hell free card? So often we fall into that trap. And you might be saying, man, I get what you're saying, Eric. I, I heard a message something like this years ago and I was fired up and I was like, God, I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put all my weight in you and I'm gonna start making all my decisions on what you say and, and I'm gonna trust you fully, God. And when I did that, things didn't turn out the way I prayed they would. Th things didn't work out the way I thought 
that they would all work out. And, and, and I've had difficulty as I did this. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know why that happens. I could be a preacher and give you a slick talk on this is why everything happens and blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I do not know why sometimes we pray and we trust God and we go all in and it doesn't turn out the way we wanted it to. And sometimes it does. I don't know. We, we go, God, I'm gonna trust you. I, I know I'm hearing from you. I know you're the one telling me to do this. So I'm all in, I'm gonna do it. And then we get into it and we're like, mate, did I mishear God? Because this isn't working out the way I thought it was going to. But here's what I do know. I do know that is in the struggle. It is in the faith journey of trusting when things don't always play out the way I thought they would. That's actually when God shapes me. That's when he builds character. That's when he makes me into who. You see, you can never become a disciple, a follower of Jesus where you're journeying with him in your life unless you go through the struggles, because it's the struggle that actually builds faith. But so often we say, God, I'm all in. And we put our feet, our weight, our everything in who he is and what his word says, and then it's difficult. There's a challenge. It doesn't turn out the way we thought it would. But I'm reminded of Romans 8:28. It says that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You see, God, in his infinite wisdom, sees the whole universe and everything in it and every person he knows personally. The Bible says he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything about us. And he is working all those things for his ultimate glory and for our good as his children. And so even though I'm sitting here and I'm saying, God, I'm trusting you and this is not working out the way I thought it would and this is difficult, I know that God is working all that to shape me and to make me into who he wants me to be, to prepare me for the mission and the purpose of my life. And it is only in that struggle of fully trusting him that I experience that. But that's hard. That's difficult. Faith is tough. It's more than just belief. You see, belief is I believe it's a stool. Faith is I believe it's a stool and I'm gonna put my action in it. It's when faith, faith is when belief and action collide. They come together. That's where biblical faith is. And so I wanna ask you today, are you living your life by faith? Are you walking by faith? Are you making your decisions by trusting in who Jesus is and what he's done? We're called to, to say yes, to take action, to trust him. But here's what I know, because it's true in my own life, and that's that so many Christians, so many followers of Jesus, they stumble through life in survival mode. They stumble through life in survival mode and just, just hope they can make it, right? It's like, well, I've, I've trusted Jesus for my salvation. I believe he's the son of God, but now I'm gonna just kind of live in survival mode. Right? I'm gonna make the decisions. I'm gonna be in control. I'm gonna have my feet on the ground. I'm just gonna use Jesus kind of as a crutch, but I'm not truly gonna follow him in my life. I know that's been true in my life, and I would bet that there's been seasons and times where it's true in your life too. You see, God is not calling us to survive the world, but he's calling us to change the world. He's calling us to live for him. You see, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could live in fear and that we could just, you know, kind of trust him. He died on the cross so that we could experience his power. He was resurrected from the dead. And the Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I mean, that is crazy. That is crazy. But it's true. See, the Bible says the spirit of the followers of Christ have not been given a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. But too many of us, including myself, have stopped praying prayers that are radical. Like, we, we, we may pray, right? God, help so-and-so who's got surgery this week. God, um, provide for my family, help my kid, help my marriage. Those are all important things. And we need to pray for him. But are we praying for God to do the impossible? 
in our lives and in his church? Are we just kind of in survival mode? There's a massive difference. And this is what I know. I've studied revival historically. I've, I've studied the scripture. And God uses people who believe him for the impossible, who live by faith, who believe that God can do anything and move any mountain and change any situation. That's who God uses. And I don't know about you, but I've got one of these lives. One. And I don't know if you know it either, but reincarnation is not real. It's just something to make us feel better about this, the fact that our lives aren't going in the right direction. Maybe we'll get another one down the road or something. It's just not going to happen, okay? If it did, you may come back as a pig or something like that. It wouldn't be good, okay? You're going to get slaughtered and eaten. It's just not real, right? We got one life to make an impact for the glory of God. And here's what I know as a follower of Jesus Christ, the only reason I'm still living is because God's not done using my life. The only reason you're still here as a follower of Jesus is because God's not done with your life. If you're not a follower of Jesus, God's trying to tell you, trust me today. Trust me today. So often we lose that belief of God in the impossible. And today, I want us to look at a life of a guy who, whose name was Joshua in the Old Testament. And Joshua was this incredible leader, this incredible man of faith who believed God for the impossible. So let me tell you a little bit about Joshua before I read the verses we're going to look at today. Joshua was a, was, was a Israelite. He was Jewish, and he was born into slavery. The Israelites had been in slavery for 400 years. That's a long time, folks. That's almost two times older than the United States of America. 400 years, the people of God had been in slavery in Egypt. Their lives were not good. Their situation was bad. And Joshua was born, just like all these others, were born into this environment. And God began to move and do some incredible things because these people believed that God would do uh, uh, something to break them free, to, to set them free from slavery, and, and to give them a new hope and a new future and a new purpose. And God raised up a leader named Moses. And Moses would lead the people of Israel out of slavery. But God would pave the way for them to go. As you remember, if, if you've read the book of Exodus, there were 10 plagues that came on Egypt to force the hand of, of Pharaoh to set the people free from slavery. So Joshua and his friends, they literally visually saw God move in impossible ways. I mean, they were in the worst circumstances you can imagine, and yet God is moving and shaping a way for them to be set free. And he sends these 10 plagues, and the people break out of slavery. And as they're on their way out, Joshua sees God part the Red Sea. Are you kidding me? I mean, God literally parts the sea, and the people of God walk through it. I mean, can you imagine what they experienced, how the power of God moved amongst them? And it washed over the army of the Egyptians as they went through the sea. As they fled out of Egypt, Joshua would rise up into power, and he would literally become Moses' right-hand man. As Joshua was leading alongside Moses, they sent 12 spies into the land to evaluate the land. You see, God had told them that I'm going to send you this land. You're going to go and you're going to take this land, and it's going to be your promised land for my people. Well, as these 12 spies went and they began to observe, what they saw was intimidating. They saw a, 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 an enemy that looked impossible to defeat. People that looked impossible that they could take on. Joshua and Caleb were two of those 12 spies. And these two men, they believed God could, could win them. They believed that God could help them win against their enemy. They, they had a belief that God could do the impossible and, and help them overtake these people who were their enemy. But the other 10 spies that were with them didn't have the same faith and belief. They had lost it. They're kind of like us. We see God do these miraculous things, and then the next week, we don't have any faith anymore. Or at least that's like me sometimes. 
And that's the way these other 10 spies were. And they were afraid and fear won the day. Now, I want to tell you what happened. Because those 10 spies came back and reported to the people of God and, and the people of God chose not to move forward, these peoples would spend the next 40 years. Now, I just want you to chew on that for a minute. Think about your life, 40 years. 40 years. That is a long time. For the next 40 years, the Israelites, including Joshua and Caleb, would wander in the wilderness. Can you imagine how frustrated Joshua was? He's like, man, because of these people's decision, I'm now having to wander in the wilderness for 40 years instead of going to the promised land of God. Now, that's a lot like our lives, isn't it? Think about it. A lot of us have to deal with the decisions of someone else. But you know what I love about Joshua? He didn't lose his faith. He didn't lose his belief in God. I think if that happened to me, I would lose it. If I had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because of the decision of someone else, I'd probably be pretty frustrated and think, where is God now? But after 40 years, he still believed that God would give them the promised land. He never lost his faith and believed in who God was and what God could do. Well, then Moses dies and God leads them into the promised land. And they begin to take over their enemies and God begins to do these miraculous works and these incredible things for his people. It's an amazing thing as we look at what God did through Joshua and the leaders. The interesting thing, I was talking to somebody about this this morning, about this specific story, and 10 of those spies that said, no, we're not following you, God. We don't believe you're big enough. They all died. But Joshua and Caleb didn't. And they would lead the people of God into the promised land. And as they were taking over the promised land, there's a story. It's a very famous story in Joshua chapter 10, verse 7 through 15, where we see just how big his prayers and faith and belief in God truly were. So I want you to hear this story. In Joshua chapter 10, the army is, is making their way. They are taking over their enemy, leading into the promised land. And listen to this story, Joshua 10, verse 7 through 15. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After all night marching from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. Check this out. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So here they are, they're going in to take their enemy, and God throws the enemy into confusion. That's how awesome our God is. Throws them into confusion, and it says, So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekai and Machadah as they fled before Israel on the road down to Beth Horon to Azekai. The Lord, check this out, hurled down large hailstones down on them. And more of them died from the hail than were killed by the sword of the Israelites. You see, God was with his people. And Joshua believed God enough to take the step and to move forward and to trust God into leading them into the promised land. It goes on and it says this. It says, on that day, the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. Now, don't miss this next part. Joshua said to the Lord, in the presence of Israel. Joshua didn't just say this, you know, praying off by himself. He says it in front of the people of Israel. He believes in God enough to call it out and say, God, do this. And listen to his bold prayer. Sun stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now, as we see Joshua's incredible faith, 
bold enough to stand before the people of God and pray and say, God, I'm asking you to do something you've never done before. I'm asking you to do the impossible, literally. I want you to stop. I just would like you to stop the sun. If you could do that for me today, if you could just stop the sun up there so that I have time in the light to take out my enemy and so that I can win. He had the radical belief and faith in God enough to ask him to do it, and guess what? God did it. He said there's never been a day like it since, and there'll never be a, there's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a human being, a day when God stopped the sun so that his people could have victory. As I think about this story and I, and I go back and I even think about the spies as they came up and they began to view what was ahead of them and then they would choose not to move forward because of fear. I believe that's a picture of the church. You see, every church comes up against challenges. Every church walks up and says, if we're gonna do great things for God, we're gonna have to go into the land and we're going to have to take on giants. We're going to have to take on difficulty. We're going to have to, to do and see God do the impossible. And the churches that step forward and say, yes, God, the people that step forward and say, yes, God, we believe you can do anything, are the people in the churches that God uses to do the impossible. The ones who don't simply become stagnant and decline and ultimately die. You see, that's kind of a picture of us. We stand and we know the challenges are great to do what God's called the church to do. I mean, when you really honestly take a look, see, God didn't call the church just to show up and have a service. God called the church to go and to trust him and to make disciples and to do the impossible. And Jesus himself said, you will do even greater things than I have done. But do we believe that? Are we just kind of halfway trusting God? We, we so glad we don't have to go to hell. This is awesome. I'm so glad I don't have to go to hell. Who wants to go to hell with me today? Nobody, right? No, we're so glad we get to go to heaven. And that's kind of sometimes where we leave it. But you see, I believe God wants your life and my life and this church's life to be more than that. To truly trust and pray and believe and take steps of faith for God to do the impossible. It's an amazing story when you think about the fact that God made the sun stand still. So we need to ask ourselves this. Do we believe God can? Do we believe God will? Now, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know every one of us have challenges there's family things, there's career things, there's personal struggles. And sometimes those personal struggles seem to rear their ugly head and just continue to just beat you down. And you feel like, God can't love me. There's no way I'll ever overcome this. There's no way I'll ever be able to do or be or whatever. And I wanna remind you today that God is bigger than any thing you face. God can remove any mountain. He can take out any enemy. He literally can throw your enemy into confusion and send hailstones down to wipe them out. That is our God. There is a God who can stop the sun literally. This is not some fairy tale story. I've been to this place. I've been to this place where this actual battle took place and God did this. And the God of the universe who knows you personally is simply looking for people who will trust him. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you're gonna trust God and tomorrow everything's gonna work out. That's what you call prosperity gospel. I'm here to tell you the biblical gospel. You may trust God and because of somebody else's decision, you may wander in the wilderness for a little bit longer, but don't lose faith. Joshua didn't. You see, Joshua didn't lose faith for 40 years and God chose to use Joshua to do the impossible. You see, Joshua's Hebrew name is Yeshua. You know what that means? It's Jesus. God saves salvation. It's a picture of what Christ has done for us. 
That's who our God is, and those are the kind of people that he uses. And he wants to use your life. You know, I can't speak but before I got here, but I know since I've been at Vaughn Forest, that's our vision, man. We want to do whatever it takes to see God glorified and to see his name made famous in this city and beyond. And as I look around at my life and many times the lives, oftentimes, of American believers, we choose comfort. I was talking to a member of our church earlier after the first service, and many of his, he's from Cameroon in Africa, and many of his friends are being slaughtered right now. People he knows. And we think we got it tough. I mean, their lives are hanging in the balance. And yet, we have so much, and yet we take it for granted. You see, the same way God said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 1.8, when all this started, he said, go and take your land. Go and take your land. And the Israelites began that process, and we've talked about that today. But he's telling us the same thing. He's telling us to go and take what he's called us to do. I want you to hear Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is called the Great Commission. Jesus has died on the cross. He's been resurrected. He's with his followers before he's about to go be with God the Father, and he tells them this. He says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because I have all authority on heaven and earth, go and make. You see, in the Old Testament, he told him, he said, go and take the land. Today, because of what Christ has done and who we are in him, he's telling us the same thing. He's saying, go, but you don't have to take. I've already done everything for you. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And check this out, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has called us from go and take in the Old Testament. That was his promise to the people of Israel. To now, the promise to us is to go and make. Let me ask you a question. Will we go? Will we trust him with our lives? Will we trust him with our resources? Will we trust him to take big risk? Or will we be like the spies and, and look ahead and go, oh, no, 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 it's too much. God can't do that. There's too, too much, costs too much money. We don't have enough people. We, we don't have this. We don't have that. I don't know about you, but I can't live like that. We must believe that God owns everything, knows every person, and wants to see his name made famous. So will you say yes to him? Because if God can invade space and time and stop the sun for Joshua and the army to defeat the enemy, God can invade any situation you're up against. He can invade any situation our church has. He has been faithful every day. He's never removed himself. And he will be faithful moving forward. The question is, will we step forward? Will we believe him for the impossible? When Jesus was raised from the grave, he made a way for us. And now he's called us to something more. He's called us to something more. Not to just exist, but to live for him. To not just believe in him, but to fully live by faith and put everything we have and trust him. You see, that's where life to the full is found, is trusting him. Listen, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for my own life, and I want to pray for our church. And in just a minute, our band's going to come out and lead us in a song. And as they lead us in this song, maybe you want to come down here and pray and just pray for something that's going on in your life, but maybe you just want to pray for our church and pray for God to just continue to change our lives and for us to surrender to him. See, here's the thing, guys. God is waiting on us. We're not waiting on God. God's ready. 
God's already done it. He's telling us to go. He's telling us to make. Will we go? Will we make? In our family, in our career, in our hobbies, in in our children, in our parents. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I just pray right now for every person in this place that you would just continue to work in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would just move in a special way. And Lord, I just pray as we respond to you that you would be honored, that you would be glorified. We believe that you can do anything, God. Help us to not live by fear, but to live by faith and remind ourselves of your power and your awesomeness and your majesty, God. Lord, we love you. And we just thank you for your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.